In the jungles of southern Costa Rica, a small single-engine plane touches down on a dirt airstrip in the heart of the Osa Peninsula. All around, ears perk up and take notice, for this is no ordinary place. But the one National Geographic refers to as the most biologically intense place on the planet. Located on the Osa Peninsula in southern Costa Rica sits perhaps the richest of all lands, Corcovado National Park, where a fragile web of life hangs together by threads thousands of years old, a web many here are now fighting to keep from being torn apart forever. At 100,000 acres, Corcovado is small compared to many North American national parks. Yet within its borders lie more than 700 different species of trees. Among their branches and root systems, they provide habitat for more life forms than in all of Mexico, the United States, and Canada combined. Although its delicate ecosystem has taken eons to evolve, Corcovado only became a national park in 1975. Its designation due in large part to this man, Alvaro Ugaldi. Alvaro has been instrumental in developing Costa Rica's national park system since it began in the 1970s. There are many reasons why Corcovado exists. Uh, when we sit like now in the midst of this extraordinary place and life is just jumping around us, there is obviously one biological reason for Corcovado to exist. It's, it's obviously one of the most diverse uh, ecosystems in the planet. The reasons to establish it as a national park, though, go be way beyond that. Uh, obviously, it is an ecosystem that ought to serve the local community. Uh, intact as it is, functioning, not destroyed into something else. The other important reason it is it is part of a national system, and our goal as builders of the park system in Costa Rica, we were aiming, or we are aiming, still at it, we're aiming at saving all the species in this country. And all the species in this country don't happen to be in the mountains around San Jose or in Guanacaste. They happen to be where they are. And a lot of them are here in Osa, a lot of them. You have my email and everything, everybody? Alvaro is one of a growing number of people now dedicating their lives to saving the treasures of Corcovado National Park. He's joined by owners of several dozen eco-lodges established nearby, hoping to make low-impact tourism a cornerstone of a sustainable, non-destructive local economy. Eco-lodges are helping preserve a 200,000-acre buffer zone surrounding the 100,000-acre park. This buffer zone encompasses critical migration routes for forest animals and serves as a biological corridor that may one day reconnect the park with the Costa Rican mainland to the north and east. The owners of these ecolodges help by buying up large pieces of land and setting up reserves. They pay for the land by building small yet comfortable lodges that house visitors and provide non-extractive employment to local residents. Well, the uh, eco-lodges, which is an overused word, but the small-scale sustainable lodge that uh, brings tourists in can help to raise the awareness and the consciousness of people. They come and show people the rainforest, and suddenly it's not an abstract idea anymore. They really feel it in their heart, and they can really see, and they can really understand, oh, yeah, now I see why rainforests are so important. They can go back home and they can help in a number of ways by uh, not buying timber that comes from rainforests, whether it's from the Osa or any other place around the world, or they can uh, send donations. They can, there's a number of different ways they can help to protect rainforests. Joel Stewart and his wife, Baylin, run El Romanso, an eco-lodge on the Osa Peninsula. 14 centimeters. One of Joel's primary goals, he says, is education providing guests with information he hopes will leave them inspired to help save the forest for the future. So, here's your rest mode here. Raise your knees, 
and the ascender. Right hand up, left hand ready to shoot this up, heels back, and you're done. Okay. Using a system of ropes, harnesses, and other climbing equipment, Joel takes first time guests up into the rainforest canopy, more than 100 feet above the forest floor. Here you see the forest from an entirely new perspective, one full of animals, flowers, and insects, in many cases completely isolated from the forest below. Rainforest trees are perfect for climbing. Their column-like trunks extend uninterrupted by branches until they spread out to form the canopy. It's almost impossible to determine the age of these trees because unlike trees of temperate forests, rainforest trees enjoy an endless growth season. They never need to go dormant and pause growth, which is how temperate trees produce their rings. The umbrella-like canopy captures infinite energy from the sun, feeding the trees and everything that lives in them. Canopy of the forest is one of the most important areas of, of any tropical rainforest. There's over, between 80 and 90 percent of the life is up here. It's where all the sunlight is, and so that's where most of the growth, most of the animal species are, where all the fruits and the flowers are. And it's a really important area because you get up here and you can really experience the life of a forest to its fullest. It's incredible the views you get up here. I've been up here and had monkeys right next to me in branches. Uh, really close, very close up. They act differently when you're up in the tree than when you're on the ground. They come much closer. You see butterflies you don't see down the ground. You see a lot more of the birds up here. Uh, some strange insects, a lot of different types of things. And you can also observe the different trees here. With the over 700 species of trees that you find in the Osa Peninsula, there's an incredible, incredible amount of different colors and shapes up here. And you can see the flowers, you can see the fruits, and all the interactions of the animals with those. Uh, I like it a lot. You get a nice cool breeze up here. You get a feeling of openness. And uh, it's just an incredible place to come up and hang out and spend the day. It was really fantastic. Much easier than I would have ever thought. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it's having confidence in uh, your guide and uh, the clarity with which he explains the process. And that made a big difference. Uh, I found it easy going up and easy coming down. And uh, once you're up there, it's uh, it's a pretty unique experience, especially if you have a, a little breakfast up there that helps. Actually, traveling into the rainforest is critical to developing a full appreciation of its many wonders. Most eco lodge owners and their hired guides have hard-earned knowledge about the forest and eagerly share it with their clients. The Osa Peninsula receives three to seven meters of rain annually, more than enough to keep dozens of streams flowing year round. The creeks that drain the peninsula carve beautiful pathways through the forest before spilling out into the warm waters of the Pacific. Their many waterfalls provide a cooling way to escape the forest's high humidity and heat. Around the globe, rainforests are the most biologically rich places on Earth. Covering less than 6% of the Earth's land surface, rainforests are home to 50 to 70% of all life forms and just may be the nucleus of this planet's web of life. Visitors find the diversity of wildlife on the Osa Peninsula absolutely astonishing. Those who visit the Osa experience up close and in person the many intrinsic yet often subtle elements of a healthy rainforest. Like breathing the clean, cool air at the bottom of a waterfall, watching wildlife living each day as it has for thousands of years, or looking out over a sea of trees with the very real possibility that no two are the same species. People's reactions to the rainforest are as varied as the people themselves. Many come to see the hundreds of beautiful birds and animals that make the Osa home, while others are drawn by the plant life. Some want to explore all the forest has to offer, and others come to simply relax. Lana Wedmore owns and operates the Luna Lodge, 
on the border of Corcovado National Park. There's so much computers and cell phones and people's lives right now are just running so fast. And I think everyone needs time for themselves and to realize where they're going in their life. And I think just sitting on the deck, on this deck, or on their decks of their bungalows, and just looking at the greenery, I think, brings peace within. And that's really important right now for everyone. You need time for yourself. Just one more time, drop that. And then come forward, grab your big toes. Recently, Lana has begun marketing her lodge as a yoga retreat. People come from all over the world to practice yoga on a deck overlooking the heart of the forest. Lana's vision of creating a place of peace based on respect is an example of how these businesses work to become positive influences in the local communities. You know, I think in any business in the world, you know, your employees not, should not work for you. They should work for themselves. They should do a good job because they want to do a good job inside. And one thing that we tell our people, you know, the most important thing is respect. Respect not only for the clients and ourselves, but for themselves and for nature. And one thing that we've really tried to teach our employees is about littering and about recycling and how important it is. And hopefully they can teach their kids because a lot of our employees have families and they know that at this place that they're not supposed to do that. And so hopefully that will carry on to their children. And we invite their, their families can come up here and stay here once a month and be here. Yeah, we definitely encourage that. Yeah. And they're proud for working here. Mm -hmm. People in the ecotourism business on the OSA are proving there are ways to develop sustainable economies and showcase the beauty of the rainforest while helping to protect it. Tourism is currently Costa Rica's number one source of foreign investment. The Costa Rican government has learned that people will pay to experience pristine tropical environments that have disappeared in other parts of the world. If we can be very focused and if we can make tourism really maintain the standards of sustainable development over the future, we will mark parameters for all other industries in the country as well because tourism is affected and interacts very effectively with a lot of different uh, industries in the country which provide uh, goods and services to our, to our industry. And so if we can maintain those parameters for us, we will automatically be affecting the rest of the country in a very positive way. John Lewis is the founder of Lapa Rios, an upscale eco-lodge on the peninsula. Former Peace Corps volunteers, John and his wife Karen built the lodge after deciding their comfortable life in the U.S. had left them with a need for adventure. Originally designed to be a simple bed and breakfast for bird watchers, Lapa Rios has evolved into one of the finest lodges on the peninsula. And more importantly, the Lewises have used their hotel to help finance the protection of a thousand acres of rainforest. It's primarily a land preservation project, and the hotel part, the, the resort part of, of Lapa Rios, is the financing vehicle. We tolerated the hotel um, because we had a thousand acres, and we said, hey, with a thousand acres of rainforest, how about if we create a private nature reserve? And then if we have an ecotourism project um, to prove or to demonstrate that ecotourism can actually finance the preservation uh, of land and also be a vehicle where we teach people, educate people, and bring people into a, a natural environment. So it kind of evolved from bed and breakfast for bird watchers to um, what, the, what this is here, which is still small. It's only 15 rooms, um, but it's a, it's a place where people come to experience nature and to feel like they're participating in a project that's making a difference in the world. There is no better place to truly experience the rainforest than in Corcovado National Park. Corcovado absolutely teems with life and begs for discovery. 
Some have even called Corcovado a global seed bank because so many species that long ago vanished from other parts of Central and South America can still be found in Corcovado. The Osa was born during the Cretaceous period, several thousand kilometers to the south and west of its current location. The Osa Peninsula was carried to the newly forming Central American Isthmus by the northeastward movement of the East Pacific Tectonic Plate. This plate would eventually split into the Cocos and Nazca Plates, while accreting material onto the trailing edge of the Caribbean Plate, eventually forming a peninsula. Its historical isolation undoubtedly has contributed to the high number of species endemic to the peninsula's forests and its unusual botanical relationship to South America. Another event that fostered the richness and character of the Osas forest took place about two and a half million years ago. The formation of the Panamanian land bridge linking the great continents of South and North America. This formation dramatically altered the patterns of the world's ocean currents, which some scientists blame for the onset of the last ice age. On a slightly less grand scale, the great American faunal interchange began and brought the melding of two distinct biomes. South American species spread north, and North American species spread south. Many extinctions followed, but eventually the blending of these two systems established ecological hierarchies within themselves, and the present-day character of what is called neotropical rainforests of Central and South America was created. Walking the trails of Corcovado, visitors witness the everyday events of an environment in balance. A colony of leafcutter ants strips leaves from the trees. They use the plant material to make fungus, which feeds the colony. Look closer and you can see even smaller ants, called minims, riding on those leaves. These tiny ants help protect the worker ants from a parasitic fly which tries to lay eggs on their backs while they are unable to defend themselves. These and other activities ultimately circulate huge amounts of nutrients essential to the lives of vast assemblages of other organisms. Corcovado National Park is what is known as a tropical wet forest. Environmentally speaking, Corcovado is as close to perfection as one can get. The big surprise for me has been how livable the jungle's been. You know, I grow up in America with these jungle movies of everything's going to come and get you, and it's actually quite the contrary. Well, you do need to be careful and be cautious in your travels. Um, there are fewer insects here than there are in my home in Colorado. The Osas forests are the most magnificent in Central America and rival in height and diversity the forests of the Amazon. They also embody all that is most fascinating about these rich and unusual ecosystems. They are the only terrestrial ecosystems on Earth where the natural processes of growth and decomposition take place continuously throughout the year, uninterrupted by winters and droughts that so bedevil other ecosystems. In these forests, a myriad of decomposers continuously and rapidly recycle nutrients back into the living fabric of the forest and ensure minimal waste by leaching from the heavy rainfall they receive annually. As a consequence, nutrients do not accumulate in the soils upon which these forests grow. Studies have shown that as much as 99% of nutrients in these tropical soils are contained within just the first five centimeters of ground. When this forest is cut for agriculture or other purposes, these delicate relationships are destroyed, making re-establishing a rainforest nearly impossible. Another way humans are contributing to the downfall of the rainforest is poaching. In 2004, it was reported that both white-lipped peccaries, which are a type of wild pig, and the jaguars were on the verge of extinction. The poaching in the park is extremely serious, extremely serious. And, and I believe that uh, even though we have advanced a lot on the forestry sector and other elements that were necessary, 
we were, we were not able to advance as much as possible with uh, the protection of uh, the, the protected area, especially the National Park, Corcovado National Park. Illegal poaching is a major concern. I need to put more researchers, more tourists, and more enforcement in the area, not just enforcement. We can achieve the same goals we, we would like through enforcement, through letting more tourists and more researchers in the area. Increasing the number of people in the park will do a couple of things. More people means more user fees to be used in employing more park rangers. More visitors may also create more opportunities for those working illegally in the park to be exposed and reported. I, I don't say this in exaggeration or anything like that. I think OSA is the most spectacular ecosystem I've ever been to. I'm sure there are spectacular ecosystems everywhere, but the activity of wildlife that you find here in the Neotropics, compared to these outstanding cathedrals, of course, just to, so come and see them. I mean, if nothing else, come and leave some resources in the Osa region. That'll help the people, that'll help the park. And if you have more resources, you'll be very welcome to team up uh, to save this in perpetuity. When scheduling your trip to the park, Make sure to plan for multiple days. Take time to experience life in the forest. It changes every day. Unlike the forests of mid-latitudes, rainforests are considered high turnover environments. In mid-latitude forests, trees receive their water and nutrients from a firmly embedded root system. In the tropics, trees spread their roots over the ground horizontally, which helps stabilize the tree and allows it quick access to soil surface nutrients. Because most tropical trees grow continuously all year, they tend not to live as long as their temperate counterparts. When one tree succumbs to the wrath of time, it in turn spawns an array of plant life that's been lying dormant, patiently waiting for the sun's rays to spark another incarnation. Many species of animals and plants have evolved specifically to take advantage of newly created light gaps. Spending time in these newly created light gaps is a fascinating study, full of countless subtleties that make rainforests the biological wonderlands they are. The rivers that drain Corcovado are great for exploring on a hot day. Rivers provide a natural break in the canopy offering a new way to see the forest. And it's often possible to access beautiful waterfalls where creeks enter rivers. By foot or by canoe, the rivers are a great path to travel through and see the forest. But because of inherent risks in exploring the rainforest, it's highly recommended that park visitors use a guide. There are numerous knowledgeable and dependable guides available for hire in Puerto Jimenez. Their knowledge of the forest and ability to see things many would overlook makes guide money well spent. The Osa Peninsula is home to many threatened and endangered species. Species like the scarlet macaw. Mating for life, macaws often live to be 60 to 80 years old. They can often be seen sitting side by side, conversing and loving in sometimes authoritative tones. Their extremely colorful plumage has made them popular pets around the world. And the illegal pet trade, as well as deforestation, now threatens all macaw species. Because of its isolation, the Osa Peninsula has retained a large population of scarlet macaws. The Osa has the highest population density of these birds anywhere in their Central and South American range. Scarlet macaws are particularly fond of almond nuts, and they are the only birds with beaks powerful enough to crack open the tough husk of the almond fruit and extract the nut. Although scarlet macaws are considered endangered, they are easily seen on the Osa Peninsula and even in the trees that line the streets of the peninsula's biggest town, Puerto Jimenez. With a population of around 3,000, 
Puerto Jimenez is a colorful little town of Costa Ricans, North Americans and Europeans. People first settled here to exploit the gold found in the rivers and streams. The gold rush that put the Osa Peninsula on the map was not unlike what occurred in Northern California during the mid-1800s. Eh, a mí me llevaban el oro, yo lo pesaba y les vendía a ellos la comida y ellos tomaban mucho licor porque al orero le ha gustado mucho el licor. Este, y sacaban mucho, mucho oro, cantidad. Y este, fuimos a orear y ella me dijo, vamos a comenzar aquí, comenzamos y a catear y... Sacamos en el cateo 18 gramos, siempre los recuerdo. Entonces ella me dijo, ah, no, esto no sirve para nada. Vámonos de aquí. Y yo le dije, porque ya yo no estaba acostumbrada a ver eso. Y entonces yo le dije, pero 18 gramos le parece poquito. Entonces ella, ah, no, no, eso no es nada para nosotros. Nos fuimos a orear a otra parte cerca de ahí. Recuerdo que siempre fue en la raíz de un palo. Y ahí sacamos bastante Bastante. Costa Ricans are friendly people. Their country motto is Pura Vida, or Pure Life. In 1949, their constitution called for the dismantling of the military, making Costa Rica the only country not to have an army. Today, Puerto Jimenez serves as a gateway to travelers visiting the Osa Peninsula and surrounding areas. There are a variety of low-cost restaurants and hotels that provide high-quality accommodations for the money. The people are friendly, accommodating, and often one of the main reasons people end up spending more time on the Osa than originally planned. The marine life that visits the waters surrounding the peninsula is possibly as diverse as the life in the forest. The Golfo Dulce, or Sweet Gulf, is the body of water that separates the peninsula from the Costa Rican mainland that lies to the north and east. The gulf is 50 kilometers long, 20 kilometers wide, and 200 meters deep. Its waters are nutrient-rich and support a robust marine population including dolphins, visiting humpback whales, and whale sharks. Humpback whales from both southern and northern latitudes are now known to calve in Costa Rica's waters. Scientists from Cascadia Research discovered a number of humpbacks traveling from as far away as the Antarctic, making it the longest mammal migration ever recorded. 8,400 kilometers or 5,100 miles each way. The government is working on protecting the land that surrounds the Gulf in hopes of reducing the damage caused by deforestation. Erosion and runoff from deforestation and unsustainable agricultural practices in the later half of the 20th century have introduced unmanageable silt loads into the Gulf. These practices damaged the fragile coral reefs and polluted fresh water supplies. Currently, the government and many private organizations are working on reducing the amount of silt introduced into the Gulf. Legal and non-legal logging has been significantly decreased due to the efforts of environmental organizations and a government that is beginning to realize the importance of protecting its natural resources. Drake Bay is located on the Pacific side of the peninsula. Its remoteness makes it an ideal place for those looking to really get away. Many people think Drake Bay is what Hawaii must have been like before it was developed. There are literally no roads in Drake Bay. For the area's 300 residents, the primary modes of travel are boat, horse, and foot. There are a few lodges in the area that offer comfortable and friendly accommodations. About 10 to 12 miles off the coast is Caño Island, whose beautiful blue water makes it a haven for snorkelers and divers. The island was held sacred by the indigenous people, 
who inhabited the island before the arrival of the Spanish. Perfectly round stones are believed to mark the presence of an ancient burial site, but many questions still remain regarding the significance of these stones. It is said that Caño Island receives more lightning strikes than in any other place in Central America. Some think this may be one of the reasons the island was considered sacred to the indigenous cultures of the region. One thing is for certain. Caño's beauty is undeniable. There are over 35 national parks and reserves in Costa Rica, each with its own beauty and appeal. Unfortunately, the one thing they have in common is isolation. Development and deforestation have turned each into a biological island, threatening many species of animals and plants that need adequate genetic transfer to keep populations healthy and stable. Tapers in Corcovado, for example, are isolated from other populations found in the Talamanca Mountains of the mainland, endangering their long-term prospects for survival. Costa Rica hopes to eventually remedy this by reconnecting all of its parks through biological corridors. Costa Rica is also part of the even larger Mesoamerican ecosystem. This ecosystem begins in southern Mexico and extends south into Panama. Mesoamerica holds 10% of the world, of the planet's biodiversity. Uh, all to be able to be a function of, as a corridor of Mesoamerican wildlife, we need parks and connected parks all over Mesoamerica. So Corcovado is a key link for the Mesoamerican uh, biological corridor, Mesoamerican uh, micro-ecosystem. Uh, and globally speaking, we are responsible for 10% of the world's biodiversity. So needless to elaborate more on that, I mean, it's obviously a place of global, regional, national, local, and personal importance. I mean, just extraordinary place. Alvaro says re-establishing such biological corridors will be an enormous project, requiring cooperation among local residents, local and national governments, private landowners, aided by numerous nonprofit organizations. Linking Corcovado to the mainland means working with area farmers to begin reforestation. Fortunately, many in the region favor conservation efforts now because they've learned Farming the rainforest is hard and not particularly rewarding work. The soils are basically oxidized clay, classified as latisols and ultisols. People who first settled here thought crops would be easy to grow because everything around them was lush and green. What they didn't realize is that in the rainforest, the vast majority of life-giving nutrients are already tied up in the function of the ecosystem not lying fallow in its soils, as in more temperate forests. Rainforest soils are relatively nutrient poor and require heavy fertilization. That damages water supplies and can poison land. Many current farmers now want to become involved in restorative processes, but also need to find a way to make a living. The government is working on a program to help pay farmers to stop farming and transition their fields back into forests. Nonprofit agencies are working to raise money to lease land from farmers and hire them to reforest. In order for reforesting to work, it must also be done with a variety of tree species. When reforesting is done in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, for example, the goal is to plant trees which grow fast, straight, and produce the maximum amount of harvestable timber. The goal is to grow trees, not necessarily forests, which are by nature biologically diverse. On the Osa Peninsula, the goal is to plant a forest, one which includes all the native trees and plants. If animals and birds are going to use these corridors, they must mimic as closely as possible the diversity of the true forest. The plan for this type of reforestation also allows for some small-scale sustainable timber harvesting, which means the living forest can still produce wood.
One of the biggest problems facing corridor projects is land rights. After Corcovado National Park was created in 1975, the government invited people to settle and develop land surrounding the park with the promise that one day they would receive title, giving them full ownership. But after 30 plus years of trying to farm land ill-suited for growing crops, they still don't have those titles, making it difficult to transfer or sell land for other uses. Those involved in preserving the Osa Peninsula hope one day to replant a forest that will serve many needs, a corridor for migrating animals, employment for those involved in various projects, and eventually a timber program that will be sustainable and have limited environmental impact. Some people say the fate of the world's biodiversity lies in tourism. If this is true, it's vital that monies generated through tourism stay in local communities. Otherwise, those exact people the tourism dollar was supposed to help will be left looking back to the forest for a means of survival. It's no mystery that struggling so-called third world countries need to make money or feed themselves off their natural resources. In Costa Rica, they're coming to the realization that conserving the forest has multiple and long-term benefits. People will pay good money for a true rainforest experience. The long-term economic potential of sustainable tourism far outweighs environmentally damaging resource extraction practices. Gathering seed stock from places like Corcovado can help reforest other areas, contributing to corridor projects and helping protect the region's biodiversity. Healthy rainforests also provide habitat to many of the world's threatened and endangered animals. If Costa Rica succeeds in its corridor projects, threatened populations like the bared taper may once again actually migrate to other parts of the region, increasing its chances for long-term survival. Rainforests reduce erosion during heavy rains. Over the years, countless villages and thousands of people have been lost due to the mudslides caused by deforestation. Reducing erosion also contributes to healthy fresh water supplies and healthy coral reefs, as healthy rainforests help reduce silt loads entering the pristine gulfs. Rainforests contribute to the global climate by keeping vast amounts of carbon tied up in its vegetation. When the forest is burned or the trees are cut and left on the ground to decay, carbon is released as carbon dioxide. Deforestation is the second leading producer of greenhouse gases. Medicinally speaking, the value of the rainforest to society may never be fully realized. Approximately 1% of the forest has been explored for its medicinal benefits. Yet Western doctors have a list of 7,000 medicinal compounds that are plant derivatives. There are many reasons to protect the rainforest, but the fact the forest may hold the cure for yet undiscovered diseases may be one of the most powerful. Preserving natural resources also benefits the indigenous people. Indigenous peoples of the rainforest know more about what the rainforest has to offer than we may ever know. They have much to teach us, and we would be well advised to start listening. Es un recurso de todo común, y ese la utilidad del bosque mantiene mucho parte lo de ecología, y también dentro de ella están la todas las medicinas, lo más importante para la salud, y del bosque depende todos los seres vivientes. Y el bosque también es interesante por el mantenimiento, digamos, de, de la humedad y las aguas, el río y el aire. El bosque nos da oxígeno para vivir. Entonces es importante conservar, pero no tan bien solamente conservar, sino ver eh, hasta qué punto podemos conservar y la necesidad de los pueblos. The long-term vision for Costa Rica's national park system is to eventually link all parks together biologically, ensuring genetic diversity, and helping begin environmental restoration. Eventually, these programs can spur development of long-term sustainable local economies while improving the environment. 
the Osa Peninsula could be a role model for the rest of the world, where people learn to live and coexist with the natural world. Choices made today will affect future generations, and it is within our power to choose a life in harmony. The Osa Peninsula is truly one of our planet's greatest biological treasures, a fragile web of life that offers rich rewards to every creature that lives or visits.